Hello, everyone. Thank you so much um, for joining us today for uh, this discussion on CPR. So um, this is a little bit of a different experience doing this virtually. Normally, a CPR training would be um, hopefully a bit more interactive with a demonstration component. But I think there's still some good information here and hopefully some good things that you'll you'll take away from this and be able to bring back to share with your teams. All right. Sometimes the first time you have to use this one. There we go. Okay. So um, when we talk about CPR, or you might hear some people call it CPCR, um, we're talking about cardiopulmonary and cerebral resuscitation. And so that extra C really puts the emphasis on trying to maintain good brain function, obviously. So heart, lungs, and brain. Um, and so our goal is to try to promote um, blood flow back to the heart. That's what we're doing with all of our um, resuscitation efforts. And um, because that's ultimately what's going to get the heart beating again. But everything that we're doing also should be aimed at um, trying to maintain good cerebral function to try and improve patient outcome as much as we can. So we're going to talk a lot about um, the Recover Initiative today. And um, so what is the Recover Initiative? Basically, this is where a group of veterinarians, about 100 veterinarians from different specialties and um, all different walks of veterinary medicine got together and reviewed over a thousand scientific papers, both from human and veterinary medicine, to just try to put together a set of guidelines to look at, okay, what works, what actually improves patient outcomes, and what might have a negative effect on on patient outcomes and they broke it down into these five categories that we'll, we'll go through some points on each one of these today. Um, there's about a hundred different guidelines in the full recover initiative and we're just going to hit the high points today and really focus on some of the most important ones. Um, so this has been out for a while, came out initially in 2012, but I think you know really in the last couple of years there's been a big push to make this information more accessible and really look at ways that um, you know we can offer it in a, a CE format to to, um, you know, let people get access to this and really try to apply it in their clinical practice. So why is this so important? Um, so really this is modeled after the American Heart Association guidelines, which um, in people what they do is, you know, every five to 10 years, they come out with a new set of guidelines where basically they do the same thing. They just review all of the current literature and make some adjustments to recommendations for how CPR is performed. And, you know, they certainly have the resources to then be able to look back and say, okay, for the hospitals that are really following these guidelines and, um, you know, using these algorithms that we put forward, does it have an impact on patient outcome? And I think we can really pretty unequivocally say, yes, it absolutely does. Um, and when we look at survival numbers for veterinary patients, you know, it probably comes as no surprise that it's not great. So following in hospital arrest, meaning if you have a patient in your care and it's kind of a witnessed arrest, and so you can really, you know, start your resuscitation efforts right away, survival to discharge is only about 6%, a little bit less than 6%. Um, so obviously quite low. It's greater than 20% in people, so still pretty low. Um, but there's definitely a gap there where we kind of look and say, okay, are there some things that we can do to just try and improve those outcomes in veterinary medicine a bit? And so the goal of this is to just provide a useful guideline to help us keep our knowledge current. And I do think that recover guidelines will continue to get updated periodically as time goes on. Um, this is a good way to improve consistency among veterinarians so that, you know, when your team members are working with different veterinarians, they can kind of expect that CPR is always going to go the same way and not that one person runs a code totally different than someone else does. Um, and then just training team members, you know, so putting together guidelines and protocols and online CE to train team members team members because that really is a huge part of this. And I think getting your team engaged is really important because, you know, even if the survival numbers for CPR aren't great, if we can save one more patient, I mean, that's huge for staff morale. And I also think there's a really big difference between, um, you know, running a code and even if that patient survive, doesn't survive, for your team members to be able to say, okay, well, that at least went well. We were organized, we worked as a team, we were prepared. I feel okay about that. I feel like we did everything we needed to do versus having a code where your patient doesn't survive and having people come away from it feeling like that was chaos and we forgot to do this and I couldn't find the supplies and I wish that had gone differently. So I do think that's really important from a, you know, from a team standpoint and from a staff morale standpoint. 
Okay, so the first um, part of this is just talking about being prepared. And um, so one of the big recommendations from Recover is having a crash cart or a crash box, whatever makes sense for your practice. And so the image that's shown here um, is actually a picture of one of our crash carts in our ER. We have several throughout our hospital. And the point of this is really just to have everything that you could potentially need for a CPR situation all in one spot so that you're not having to run around to look for, oh, where do we put the bottle of Epi? Don't we have a laryngoscope that has a light that works, you know, because that really takes team members away from being involved in the code. So it seems like such a simple thing, and it is, but it really makes it so much easier. So our car crash carts are pretty large and have multiple drawers. Here's kind of a list of just basic things. You want multiple sizes of tubes, your basic emergency drugs, needles and syringes, and ideally an ambu bag that you can use for ventilation. Um, the other thing I would suggest if you, you know, it might not make sense for you to have uh, a crash cart this large that takes up a lot of real estate in your clinic, but you can absolutely just use a tackle box, you know, something small that you can grab that has all of your supplies in it to just take it out of the cabinet if you have a patient that crashes. The other thing is, um, in this image, so normally we have a piece of tape that runs diagonally across the drawers of that crash cart. You can kind of see it dangling off of the bottom corner there because I took this picture actually right after we had done CPR. Um, but sealing your kit is a really good idea. And so that serves two purposes. We put a piece of tape across it that says sealed and the date and who sealed it initials it. So that's basically that person saying, okay, I double checked and everything that's supposed to be in here is in here. And then the other thing is that little piece of tape makes a big difference as far as just discouraging people from pilfering your kit, you know, when they go to intubate and the light bulb is burnt out on their laryngoscope and they're like, oh, I know there's one in the crash cart. I'm going to just go steal it. And then it never makes it back there. And you have a patient that arrests and you don't have what you need, which is really frustrating. So just putting a little easy seal like that on your kit really does make a big difference. So um, here's a side view of our crash cart, and we're going to become very familiar with these two charts as we go through the lecture today. So the one on the top is just a chart of um, emergency drug doses, which there's no shame in looking at a chart when you're doing CPR to figure out what your doses should be. And then the bottom is the CPR algorithm as part of recovery. Recover, And you'll see we have a stool behind our crash cart too, a step stool, just to um, have easy access to that because it definitely makes compressions easier, um, especially on um, larger patients that are up on a table. Okay, so I've got a couple of um, pictures here of just what the inside of our crash cart looks like to just give you ideas of how you can set this up. Um, and again, you know, for general practice purposes, it maybe doesn't need to be quite as involved, but you know, putting little foam organizers in there just keeps everything in its spot so your drawer doesn't turn into a big mess. You can see we've got not every single size of ET tubes, but several different options to accommodate the majority of patients. Um, we do have the cuff syringes attached directly to them, so we can just pull that all out. You've got your syringe to um, inflate your cuff right away, obviously the laryngoscope with some blades, emergency drugs, and then we do have syringes that are open with needles on so that it's all set and ready to go. And then um, some additional supplies. So I'd say, you know, those first two drawers are really the key things. That's definitely what you want to have in your kit. Some of this other stuff may or may not make sense for you, but I'd say, you know, we've got some bulb syringes in there just so that you can quickly try to suction out an oropharynx if you need to when you are um, intubating a patient. Um, I will suggest that you we have a red rubber catheter, like a three and a half or a five French red rubber catheter in your kit. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is later. And then if you don't have one already, um, I would suggest having an ambu bag, at least one size ambu bag on, um, you know, in stock in your hospital, just because it makes CPR so much easier. I mean, if you have an anesthetic machine nearby that you can connect a patient to when you're doing CPR, you can certainly use that. It's just, there's a lot more moving parts with that. And when people are stressed and kind of anxious and trying to get things going for CPR, you know, making sure everything is connected properly and getting the right size reservoir bag and getting it connected to oxygen and all those things take a little bit of additional time. Whereas an ambu bag, you just hook it up and, and you're ready to go. And so for ours, we do leave um, the tubing connected directly to it, which then plugs directly into our oxygen support. So oxygen um, port on the wall. So all you've got to do is connect it and you've got oxygen ready to go. And so it's pretty quick and easy. And then the last thing would be um, just having some kind of monitoring form stored with your, um, with your crash kit. And so, 
you can certainly create your own, or this is a copy of the form that you can get from the Recover website that you can download for free. Um, this one, it, it looks complicated, but once you've kind of gotten used to what's on there, it's really easy to use. And it's kind of nice because it really just involves filling in boxes or checking boxes. There's not a lot of additional writing that you have to do. And monitoring and keeping track of what's happening during a code um, is really a, a big deal and is really important. We'll talk a bit more about that later. And then the, you know, the helpful thing about this is that this is also a good way to track what drugs you use um, during a code so that you can charge for those as you as you need to and then this also becomes an important part of the medical record okay so um, any questions about the beginning part of that so far okay um, okay we have a raised hand here <clears throat> Gretchen, if you can type your question into the um, Q&A box, that would be great. Okay, well, we'll just okay. keep going. I'll keep going. And if you want to enter a question in there. Um, Oh, so ROSC stands for return of spontaneous circulation. And so basically that just means return of a heartbeat. So you'll kind of hear that term used and I'll, I'll mention that throughout here, but that's our goal is ROSC. Um, so Jamie, yeah, you can feel free to type your question into the Q&A box as well. And I'm just gonna keep going here and I'll kind of try to keep an eye out for questions as they come up there. Um, let's see. And I, um, Nancy, it looked like um, looked like you were typing a question there, and I don't think it came through all of the way. Um, Gretchen had a question of, was that correct? Humans greater than twenty percent survive to discharge. Yeah, so um, yeah, it is correct. I mean, it depends a little bit on what resource you look at, but the reported survival rates to discharge are anywhere from um, about fifteen to twenty percent, sometimes a little bit um, a little bit higher for people. Okay, so um, so we'll move on now to additional parts of being prepared. So staff training is a huge part of this, and I just think this is so important to really, um, you know, get yourself prepared for this as much as possible. And there's a question that just popped up about how do you go about defining who is in charge? Um, sometimes we have two vets present and this is confusing. Yeah, so that's a really great point. And um, I do think it is important to define right off the bat who's taking the lead because um, you know that does get confusing. We'll talk a little bit more about this though, is that if you get your staff trained really well, you don't need as much of someone to kind of run a code, so to speak. Really the only thing the, the doctors really need to be doing is potentially announcing or determining which drugs and you know giving the text the doses, although if you're using the chart, that's right there on the chart. But yes, right in the beginning, um, you just wanna have a quick conversation. Do you want me to run this? Yep, okay, good. So that you do have one person that's in charge. Um, but the staff training part of this, I mean, really the reason I think this is so key is because getting your staff at the very least just trained in the basic life support part of this um, is really important. And you know that basic life support just means compressions and ventilation. And you do not have to be someone with any medical training, medical background, anything like that to learn how to do those two things. So that could be your kennel assistant or whoever works in your grooming area or you know your front desk team um, definitely can jump in to help, especially if it happens to be a day that you're running on a shorter staff. The more hands that you can get involved, the better. And this doesn't need to be limited to just doctors and technicians. So the recommendation is to try to do staff training every six to 12 months. And um, six to 12 months will fly by before you know it. So it feels like you're doing training really frequently but that is kind of important especially um, when you know if you're in general practice and hopefully if all is going well you're not doing CPR that often and that's a good thing but the drawback to that is then you get kind of rusty and so when it actually happens you're you're sort of like oh gosh what are what are we doing here and I do have um, one question that popped up about seeing that first drawer slide again so I'll go back to that while I keep talking here Okay, so there's that first drawer slide. So, um, you know, so keeping the staff just up to date on what happens first, how do we do compressions, you know, how do we do ventilation, just doing a, a quick touch base about that during your, you know, 
staff meetings and things like that, I think really goes a long way. Um, and I, I'll go back to that slide in just a moment here, but I have the website there for Recover Initiative and I have no conflict of interest. I get no kickback from them. I just think it's a really great resource because on their website, they do have multiple different CEs geared to both veterinarians and technicians. You do pay a fee for it, but it is approved for CE, so you get CE credit for it. Um, and it's a combination of videos and you know reading through materials and then going back and doing quizzes on the material and we really encouraged a lot of our techs to do this last year and the response that we got was so overwhelmingly positive I mean even techs without a lot of experience went through that training and they were like I feel good about that like now I know what to do I don't feel nervous about CPR anymore I feel like I could jump in and help and that's really what we're trying to achieve is get as many people feeling like that as possible Okay, so I'm gonna, and this PowerPoint will get sent out too, so you'll get these images afterwards, so I'm gonna move back onto this. Okay, um, and so along with that, you know, just making sure that your staff knows where your crash kit is, that they know what's in it, when you hire new people that you, you know, go through that with them. And one good way to do that is, you know, if you've got like a staff checklist for certain responsibilities that they need to do every week or every month, adding your crash kit to that checklist is a really good thing to do that even if you haven't used it, just cracking it open to check the cuffs on the tubes and make sure everything is still working and doesn't have a leak. Does your laryngoscope still work or do you need a new light bulb? You know, looking at the drugs to make sure that nothing has expired since you used it last, those kinds of things um, is a really good thing to do on a regular regular basis so that you always make sure that that kit is ready to go whenever you need it. And then that also helps people just become more familiar with what's in there and where things are so they can find it easily. Um, and the last thing I want to mention here is just in human medicine, the evidence that rescuer teams of at least three people um, do increase survival. And so you want to have at least three people. If you can have more, that's great. But three people works really well because that's one person to do compressions, one person to do breathing, and one person to do your recording, drawing up drugs, kind of everything else that needs to happen. Um, and so if a patient arrests, this is really a shout for help type of situation where, you know, everyone should kind of drop what they're doing and come over to help until things are pretty well in hand. Um, and again, that's where I think, you know, training people that aren't necessarily part of your, your technical staff um, is really important too, because if it's a Saturday afternoon and you're just about to close and something happens and you've only got a, a couple of staff members there, you want everyone that's there to feel like they can at least jump in and do breathing or do some compressions for a couple of minutes. So um, getting your team on board, I think is, is really important. All right, so, um, so now we'll move into talking about um, the mechanics of CPR. And so I think a lot of us, um, you know, myself included, when we initially were taught about CPR, we're told about the ABCs, which is airway, breathing, circulation. And I was told that that was the order that things should happen, that you would intubate your patient really quickly and start the breathing, and then you start your compressions after that. So this is one of the most important things that's so simple, but really the recommendation has changed. So here's this algorithm that we'll come back to a few times today. For the first part of this, we're just gonna focus on um, the, um, the very top half of that, which is the basic and initial advanced life support part of things. Um, and so I think we've got, yeah, so I have that in a slide here. And so you'll notice for that blue box, basic life support, two things there, chest compressions and ventilation, and in that order. So chest compressions are the thing that gets started first period, no questions asked. And so that does mean that when you go to intubate that patient, you're going to be intubating them in lateral recumbency and you're going to be intubating a patient that's kind of getting jostled around a little bit with their compressions. But the compressions are that important that that comes first and you don't pause those compressions. Um, I want to also just draw your attention to the fact that that pink box on the top that says the indication for starting CPR is an unresponsive apneic patient. Basically what they're saying there is that Technically, the recommendation is not even that you verify if there is a pulse or a heartbeat. If they're unresponsive and they're not breathing, assume that they have arrested. With that said, I usually do at least take a second to listen for a heartbeat because that just takes a moment. But the purpose of having it written that way is so that if a patient were to arrest when there is not a doctor in the room and one of your team members notices it, that they should feel empowered to at the very least start compressions while somebody comes to get you. Absolutely, your team should, should be able to do that even if you're not in the room. And so the reason they write it that way is because it's better to start compressions on a patient that 
maybe potentially didn't need them than to wait for a doctor to come into the room and verify, yes, this patient is in cardiovascular arrest and then start compressions and have delayed those compressions because the time is, is that important. Um, Okay, so we will, um, so yes, compressions first. I mean, that is 100% the most important part of CPR. So if you're gonna do one thing and do it well, compressions. So we're gonna talk a lot about those today. Um, and then after that comes your intubation and starting your ventilation from there. All right, so chest compressions. Um, so a really good quality external chest compression achieves about 20 to 40 percent of normal blood flow. And so that really just goes to show the importance of doing a really good compression because if you're doing a not so great compression you're probably not really giving much benefit at all. And so we want to aim for a rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute. Um, and so it actually really is helpful to have a song that you can kind of sing or hum to yourself so, to make sure that you're actually keeping up with that because especially as you start to get tired, you'll sort of slow down without even realizing it. So the classic one is Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. That's the one everyone talks about to sing along to CPR. You can use another one, Bites the Dust by Queen, just depending if you're an optimist or a pessimist. Um, the challenging thing I will say is that we are getting to a point that these songs are old enough that you probably have coworkers that have no idea what either one of those are, but not to worry. There are entire websites devoted to this where you can go and look up all of the songs that have you know, beats of 100 to 120 um, beats per minute so that everyone can choose what, what suits them the best. So we're aiming for a compression depth of about one third to one half the width of the thorax. And so a deep compression is really what we're shooting for. And so that's why I mentioned the step stool in the beginning, because especially for large patients, if they're up on a table or a tub sink, and for someone like myself, who I'm kind of short, I really need a stool to get up above their chest so that I can kind of use the weight of my shoulders and my upper body to really achieve a nice deep compression. So don't be afraid to, to do that and have that nearby. And then the other important thing is allowing a full chest recoil. And so what I mean by a full chest recoil is, you know, we, we focus on the downstroke of a compression, thinking that that's the most important part. But what's happening when you perform a compression is when you push down, you're pushing blood away from the heart, so into the arteries away from the heart. And once you recoil and allow that chest to re-expand, that's when all of the blood is rushing back to the heart and that's when coronary perfusion is happening. So what you want to make sure is that, especially if you're standing up on a stool, it's easy to kind of accidentally continue sort of leaning on the patient and do a compression but not allow full re-expansion of the chest. So when I'm doing compressions, I do really try to almost consciously kind of pick up the heel of my hand so that I know that I'm allowing that chest to fully re-expand because that's when that, you know, really important venous return is happening. Okay, um, so there are a few different types of compressions um, depending on the confirmation of your patient. So for smaller patients, less than 15 kilograms or 30 pounds or so, or for keel chested patients. And what keel chested means is like a greyhound is a perfect example. It's a big dog, but their ventral thorax is actually very narrow. And so for those patients, you do what's called a cardiac pump compression, where you're actually doing your compressions directly over the heart. So at the level of the fifth or sixth rib space, or if you pull their, their front leg back, the point of the elbow kind of reaches right over where the heart sits, and that's where you're gonna do your compression. So you are actually directly compressing the heart and, and mimicking what the heart would normally do. And so it makes sense why that really only works in small patients or patients with kind of a narrow chest. Um, so there's a couple images here. So the one on the bottom there is showing, you know, what you would do like a two-handed technique for a larger dog, like a greyhound that has that narrow thorax. And then there's a couple images there for, um, you know, smaller patients like cats where you can use a one-handed technique where you kind of, you know, cup your hand around their thorax and just squeeze with your thumb and forefinger. So that's usually what I do for cats. Um, so there's a few different options there, but you just want to make sure that you're doing your compressions directly over the heart itself. So the next one is called the thoracic pump. And this is the way we want to do compressions in larger patients. So anything greater than 15 kilograms, 30 pounds or so. And this is different because we're going to be performing the compressions over the widest part of the chest. So not over the heart at all, because if you think about a really large 
you know, like a Rottweiler with kind of a big boxy chest. I mean, the chances that you're going to be able to actually gener generate enough pressure directly over the heart to even make that heart muscle move is extremely low. And so that's where we do these thoracic pump compressions. And the purpose of it is that we are trying to create a pressure change within the thorax that gets transmitted to the large vessels. And so it's kind of like when I was talking about the the recoil phase of a compression before that when you push down on the chest at the widest part that's going to generate the most pressure that gets transmitted to the vessels so on the downstroke blood flows away from the heart on the upstroke or on that recoil that's when all the blood comes back to the heart um, brachycephalic breeds so bulldogs of course they're in a class of their own so they just have kind of this round chest that you know doesn't really have a widest point and so there is you know some evidence that in those patients it might actually make the most sense to roll them over onto their back and do compressions directly over the sternum kind of like they would in a in a person but that is technically a thoracic pump mechanism because you're not actually directly compressing the heart so here's a couple additional um, images of this. So the dog on the top left is kind of like a min pin mix, you know, pretty small dog with a very narrow chest. So this is showing just a modified one handed technique. And this is how I usually do compressions on small dogs, because I feel like if I do a two handed technique right over the heart, they tend to kind of slide away from you a little bit. So I'll put one hand underneath and then just do compressions with the heel of my hand if they're small enough that I feel like I'm strong enough with with one arm to do a good job. And then for the larger dog on the bottom right, um, you can can see we're doing compressions over the widest part of the chest so that's going to be a little bit caudal and a little bit dorsal to the heart and we're trying to kind of get up above that patient so that we can really use the weight um, of our upper body to get a nice deep compression. Okay and um, so I think I have maybe one more slide on, on compressions and then we'll take a moment to take a break for any questions. So the other really important thing and this is going to come up a lot here about chest compressions is just making sure that we are rotating who is doing the compressions every two minutes and so there's a whole lot of information in the recovery recommendations about the two minute cycle and this is why it's important to have someone who is recording who grabs that recording sheet as soon as you start CPR and the first thing that they do is write on their what time we started and then that person is going to keep an eye on the clock for you because when you're doing CPR you're in a time warp it feels like you've been doing it for 10 minutes and it's been like 45 seconds so you really do need someone that is keeping track of the time for you and so having it every two minutes does two things so it minimizes fatigue so don't be the hero don't be the one that does all the compressions and doesn't let anyone else jump in because you will get tired and the quality of your compressions will suffer um, and then the other thing is that two minutes you know when we know that okay we're going to do this for two minutes that reminds us not to stop so it is two minutes without interruption kind of no matter what happens and the reason that this is so important is because we know that it takes at least one minute to achieve really good coronary perfusion and so if we're interrupting our compressions more frequently than that we're really not doing much good at all and in people they actually you know kind of observed CPR situations and found that the amount of time spent doing uninterrupted compressions was directly correlated with patient survival and so that seems like such a simple thing but what they were noticing is that you know until they really broke it down into okay don't stop compressions people would pause to look at the ECG or pause because I can't get this patient intubated or pause because okay I need to get vascular access and I can't do that while you're wiggling this patient doing compressions so compressions were being stopped so frequently that they never really had time to be effective so that two minute cycle is is really important Okay, so um, okay, so the first question was, I think, just about that crash cart image and um, drugs that are in there. And we will talk a little bit more about drugs later. But yeah, I think the key ones that you want to have in your crash cart are epinephrine, atropine. Um, your drug reversal agents would be probably wise to have included there, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. And then we do also keep lidocaine in our crash cart in case we do have a patient that maybe gets resuscitated and then goes into um, to VTAC. Um, the next question is, does it matter whether dogs are on their right or left side? And it does not. So regardless of what type of compression, whether you're doing the cardiac pump mechanism or the thoracic pump, it doesn't matter. They can just be on whatever side they happen to land on. That's totally fine. Um, any other questions right now before we move on from compressions? Okay. All right, so um, I'm just gonna mention internal cardiac massage very briefly because I'll say, you know, even in an emergency clinic where we 
probably do a lot more CPR than most, this is extremely rare that we would actually open up a chest. Um, the big thing to recognize about it is that it is a lot more effective than an external thoracic compression. You can achieve about 70% of normal blood flow by doing cardiac massage. The one time, and the reason I bring this up is that the one time that you might want to consider this route is if you have a patient that you are doing surgery on, an open cavity surgery, and they arrest while they are under anesthesia. So let's say if we're doing a foreign body surgery and we've got their abdomen open and they arrest, it probably makes a lot more sense to actually, as scary as it might sound, make an incision through the diaphragm and reach right up and do cardiac massage that way because you're already in the abdomen. That makes more sense than taking a patient with an open abdomen, rolling them onto their side and doing compressions that way that we know aren't as effective anyway. Um, and so that is one time, you know, here too, where you'll definitely see um, internal cardiac massage happen is if we're already in a chest or we're already in a, an abdomen when a patient arrests. Okay, and I had one more question pop up. I'm not sure how to. Oh, does it matter which side the person is on when they're doing compressions, I think is what that says. So um, not really. I mean, so if I'm doing compressions on a small patient, I'm probably going to have their legs toward me. You know, that's where I'm going to stand. So I just think that's easier, like in a cat, you know, I'll have their legs toward me. I'll kind of have my hand behind their back so they don't slide away from me. And I'll be doing like a one-handed compression like this. And then if it's a small dog, it's kind of like that previous image where I'll have my hand underneath their chest and I'll be doing compressions with the heel of my hand. When you're doing the thoracic pump compression, so like on a big dog where you're doing it over the widest part of their chest, it really doesn't matter. You could probably stand on, on either side and do just as effective as a, um, just as effective of a compression. Okay, so now we'll move on and talk about ventilation. So while we're intubating and starting ventilation, we're gonna continue compressions throughout that and do our ventilation simultaneously. Um, one question that comes up is, how do you try to synchronize your breathing with your compressions? And my short answer is kind of, you don't, because it's really difficult to do. I mean, 100 to 120 compressions per minute is pretty fast, but if you're really like a perfectionist and you wanna try your best, um, it actually, what you want to do is try to um, synchronize the administration of a breath with the downstroke of the compression, which sounds counterintuitive. You kind of think, why would I give a breath while someone is pushing down on the chest? But it comes back to that all important recoil phase where we want that recoil phase where the chest is re expanding to be kind of a quiet phase where blood is coming back to the heart. And if you push a big breath into the thorax during that, it actually does put pressure on those vessels and impedes venous return. So again, it's difficult to do, but if you're really trying to think about it, you'd try to time the administration of the breath to the downstroke. Um, so 10 breaths per minute, that's probably the most important part about all of this. Um, it is very slow. 10 breaths per minute is very slow and probably much slower than you're used to and much slower than anyone on TV does CPR. And so I really do, when we talk to the techs about it, we say, count this out. So that is breath, two, three, four, five, six, breath. So I am totally guilty of if I am the person ventilating during CPR, I'm just like this on the ambu bag and they're like, no, you need to slow down because I just stopped paying attention. So you do have to be very conscious about it and not over ventilate these patients because there are some negative effects associated with that. So hyperventilation, what you're doing is you are getting rid of CO2, which is a good thing to a point. But once your carbon dioxide levels drop too much, which is what will happen if you hyperventilate a patient, um, it actually causes constriction of the vessel that supply blood to the brain. So if we're trying to maintain cerebral function, that's something that we want to avoid. And then it also is going to increase intrathoracic pressure. So again, every time you push a big breath into the chest, it compresses those vessels that are trying to carry blood back to the heart a little bit. So really being conscious about breathing very slowly um, is important and actually is a little bit harder than it sounds. Okay, so now we have initiated our basic life support. So we've got compressions going, we have intubated and we've started our ventilation. Um, and then this is where we move on to advanced life support. And I wanna just call your attention to the fact that nowhere on this initial part of the algorithm do we see epinephrine or atropine. So try to stop yourself from feeling like that has to be the first thing that you have to do because it actually doesn't have a huge effect on patient outcomes. And so the priority needs to be on starting your compressions, getting your patient intubated. If you've got extra hands, then simultaneously while you're doing that, you can be hooking up your monitors and trying to get vascular access and we'll worry about drugs in a couple of minutes. But don't feel like 
epinephrine has to happen first. And so that is a little bit of a change in mindset that that is like step number six in um, administering CPR. So the next thing is step number three. And so that is getting your monitoring connected. And again, a lot of times this is all happening at the same time, you know, while you're starting compressions and doing your ventilation, you want to start getting things hooked up and try to get in an IV catheter if your patient doesn't already have one. So as far as monitors that you want correct, connected to your patient, there are two, and that is an ECG and an end tidal CO2, and that is it. So don't worry about trying to do blood pressure because that's not going to be helpful while your patient is arrested. Pulse oxes are not going to be reading effectively. So two monitors and only two monitors is all that you need. Um, and so end tidal CO2, I'm going to just step on an end tidal CO2 soapbox for a moment. So I feel like end tidal CO2, it is such a wonderful monitor and it is so under utilized. And a lot of clinics might not have it. You may legitimately not have the ability to do it. They do sell handheld and tidal CO2 monitors that kind of look like portable pulse ox that you can purchase. But I definitely have seen clinics where they have a multi-parameter monitor, but just don't have end tidal CO2 connected to it. So if you have a multi-parameter monitor, take a look at it at the side and see if you have a port for an end tidal CO2. And if you do, then use it. You know, the adapters are pretty inexpensive and that's what the picture on the bottom right corner is is just that adapter that fits in between the ET tube and the breathing circuit. And so end tidal CO2 is so important because that is the one monitor, really the only monitor that is gonna give you useful information in a patient that has arrested because your ECG, I mean, they don't have a heartbeat, so that's not telling you much. Your other monitors aren't gonna be working. End tidal CO2 actually tells you a lot. And so what end tidal CO2 is, is basically it's measuring the amount of carbon dioxide that's being exhaled at the end of a breath, but it correlates with cardiac output because what has to happen for carbon dioxide to be present is that there have to, it has to actually be blood coming back to the lungs and then that CO2 gets diffused across and then it gets exhaled. So it directly correlates not only to how well that patient is ventilating on their own, but it correlates to their cardiac output. End tidal CO2 is also a really important monitor to use in patients that are under general anesthesia because, um, you know, I. I guarantee you that that's going to be the first monitor to change if you have a patient that runs into trouble under anesthesia. If they arrest or if their blood pressure drops significantly, that end tidal CO2 will change instantly. From one breath to another, it'll go from normal, which is about 35 to 45, to 15. And so that tells you that there's a problem. Something has changed here and we need to intervene. And so when we're doing um, CPR, we're trying to maintain an end tidal CO2 of greater than 15 for dogs. So like I mentioned, 35 to 45 is normal. So it's still low um, and then greater than 20 for cats. And those two numbers do have a huge correlation with patient outcome. And so that basically is just telling us about how effective our compressions are, that if we're actually getting a readable end tidal CO2, we know that there's blood moving, there's blood circulating, and that carbon dioxide is being exchanged. The other really important part about end tidal CO2 is that it helps to verify the placement of your endotracheal tube. So if you have accidentally intubated the esophagus, you're not going to be getting CO2 back. And so if your monitor is just not reading, you should check the placement of your tube. And so that's going to help you catch those patients that are not appropriately intubated, you know, for their surgical procedures before they wake up on the table or have some other kind of complication. So it is a, it's a really helpful monitor to use. Okay, I'll step off my soapbox now. <laughs> All right, so um, we'll talk a little bit about ECG here now. So that's the other monitor that you want to have connected. And, you know, the really important thing about ECG is just recognizing that it shouldn't be used as a method of actually diagnosing cardiac arrest. And the reason for that is because um, pulseless electrical activity, or PEA, is by far the most common arrest rhythm in dogs and cats, where that ECG actually looks pretty normal, but if you listen, there is no heartbeat. It's just electrical activity that's not actually conducting a pulse. And a really good example of that, which, I mean, it sounds a little bit morbid, but I don't know if you've ever, you know, euthanized a patient that's under anesthesia and is connected to an ECG. That's a really good learning experience for your whole team to see how long it takes for the appearance of that ECG to change after you've confirmed that their heart has stopped. It's at least 30 seconds, sometimes a minute or even more that it just keeps ticking along. So when we're doing CPR, ECG is really used primarily to determine the presence of fibrillation, you know? So it might be a flat line if your patient is arrested. It might look like a normal rhythm, but they actually still don't have a heartbeat. And so the one time that the ECG changes what we do is if it shows that our patient is um, fibrillating. 
So just looking at what fibrillation looks like on an ECG, um, it can fool you because it just kind of looks like noise. I mean, it looks like an ECG that is not connected appropriately and is just reading electrical noise. But if this is what your ECG looks in a patient that you know doesn't have a heartbeat, presume that that is fibrillation. The good thing is that it's pretty rare in dogs and cats. I mean, we have a defibrillator and we don't use it very often at all because fibrillation is not a very common arrest rhythm. That's different than people who, when they arrest or have a heart attack, fibrillation is very common. And that's why you see all of the electric defibrillators all over the place in public places, but it is very different in dogs and cats. Okay, um, so I'll pause again there. Any questions at all about any of that? Yeah, so if a bulldog arrests, would you automatically put him on his back? So if I remember to do so, yes. <laughs> if I think about it, I would. I think that doing a bulldog as a thoracic pump in either position, I mean, they've got a pretty wide thorax, so regardless of whether you do your compressions on their sternum or on in lateral over the widest part of their chest, either one of them is fine, you know? And sometimes I'm actually like, oh, this is a bulldog. We should put him on his back and then you can flip them, you know, when you change over at the end of your two minute cycle. Um, but I think either one is pretty effective. But technically a lot of dogs are actually wider than they are deep. And so if you look at, you know, when you have them on their back, it's a little bit of a narrower chest. So you might get a little bit of a better compression that way. That's kind of the theory on bulldogs, but you really could do them either way. Okay, so, um, so now we finally are moving on to um, advanced life support, which is considered drug administration. And so notice here, still no epinephrine on this screen. So reversal of anesthetic drugs is the thing that should happen first. And I think, you know, for, for those in general practice, this is probably when you're going to see arrest most commonly is surrounding some kind of anesthetic event, or at least that's a good portion of the patients that you're doing CPR on. And so you want to take that moment to think about, okay, what drugs does this patient have on board and what can I reverse? So if they're connected to isoflurane, turn off the inhalant, that's number one. Um, so try to get that out of their system. And then if you are using you know, pure mu opioids like fentanyl, hydromorphone, um, morphine, those kinds of things, it is worth every penny to have naloxone in your clinic. Same thing for benzodiazepines, so midazolam, Valium, if you're using those with any frequency, have some clomazinil on hand. And you carry those drugs probably knowing full well that they will expire before you use the whole bottle, but you probably will use them more than you might think, both for those patients that are just slow to recover from anesthesia and are slow to get extubated. It's actually super rewarding to give, you know, clumazinil to a patient that's gotten Valium and has taken forever to wake up because it is instant. I mean, you give them a bolus and they're like, pop right up. Oh, hi. Okay, I'm awake now. So um, it's really useful for other purposes too, but definitely for CPR, you want to have the ability to reverse any drugs that you can. So it's, it's worth having those in your clinic. Um, and then um, dexmedetomidine, we all kind of know adipamazole or antecedent is the reversal for that. I think most of us are used to giving that IM, but in a CPR situation, you absolutely can and should give it IV so that it kicks in a little bit more quickly. Okay, so now we are back to this algorithm. So we've kind of moved through all of the different parts of that top portion there. Compressions, ventilation, getting our monitors connected, IV access if we can get it, and then administering reversals. So this is kind of what might, this might take you that first full two minute cycle to do, and that's totally fine. And actually that's kind of what Recover recommends is not even to worry about epinephrine or atropine until you've gotten to your second two minute cycle. So if epinephrine doesn't happen for two minutes, that is fine, don't worry about that. If you're organized enough and things are running smoothly and you have time to administer epinephrine within your first cycle, that's okay too. But let's say that we've gone through our first two minute cycle, we're gonna kind of pause at the end of that and take a look at our ECG, so that's the next step there. I think I have that here. So, um, so you're going to reevaluate your patient and check your ECG. So if you have achieved ROSC or return of spontaneous circu circulation, then we're done with this algorithm and we move on to, um, to patient care. So now we'll kind of work down the right arm of this. So if your patient is in asystole, so flatline, or PEA, which those are going to be definitely the most common things. Now this is where you move on to administering um, some additional emergency drugs. So epinephrine plus or minus atropine. 
So here's this chart that I think is really handy to have either stored with your crash kit or posted somewhere with an easy view of your, of your um, doctors and staff. So this has all of the emergency drugs on it. It also has your reversal agents on it. Um, so naloxone, flumazenil, adapanazole, and then defibrillation doses, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. The one thing I really want to point out here is that the recommendation for drug administration for epinephrine is low dose epinephrine. So that is 0 0.01 mg per kg. And so if you look at this chart, I would guess that it's probably a lot less than you are used to giving. So like for a 20 pound dog, you're giving 0.1 mL of epinephrine very small dose. What a lot of people are used to doing is the epinephrine high dose, which is 10 times that, giving one mil to a 20 pound dog. So it is really important to follow this chart because that is one thing that definitely has been shown to make a big difference in patient outcomes is at least starting with a very low dose of epinephrine. And so when we talk about what these drugs actually do, so epinephrine, um, it causes constriction of your peripheral vessels, which is meant to kind of shunt blood back to your heart and your core organs. Um, and it does also increase heart rate pretty significantly. And so um, that's the, the low dose versus high dose. And according to this algorithm, the high dose epinephrine is really only recommended or not even recommended. It's kind of written in, in there as consider high dose epinephrine if your patient has been arrested for more than 10 minutes and if you're going to continue CPR past that point. Otherwise, up to that, you're using the low dose which is 0 0.01 mix per kg. So the other one is atropine, and we always think about epinephrine and atropine together. It just rolls right off the tongue, epiatropine, you know, but the recommendations now are at least to just kind of think twice about whether or not atropine is indicated and definitely think twice about administering it more than one time. So atropine, what it does is reverses parasympathetic effects. And so the result of that will be an increase in heart rate, but it really only is effective for patients that have a vaguely mediated cause of their low heart rate. So if there's stimulation of the vagus nerve that's causing it, then atropine is going to help you. If not, it may not make that big of a difference. Um, and so atropine is indicated in animals with high vagal tone. So like the cat that retches and vomits really hard and then collapses, has probably had a vagal event and atropine is definitely indicated there. Or, you know, like a GDB patient that has this huge distended tympanic stomach that might be, you know, stimulating the vagus nerve um, and then arrests, atropine is definitely indicated there. But its routine use is no longer strongly recommended. Um, here's what I will say. I will say, I think most of our criticalists and emergency doctors here still always give it one time, you know, just because there are so many patients that we don't know exactly why they arrested or what led up to it. So, you know, I'll often do it when I do my first round of, do of drugs, do epinephrine and atropine, but then don't repeat the atropine after that. And the reason that there's, um, oh, the other thing I'll mention here is that, so as far as frequency of administration, drugs should only be administered every three to five minutes. And so here's another part of where that recording um, and keeping track of time comes into play is that that is every other two minute cycle, which is not very often at all. It feels like it's gonna be forever since you gave drugs the last time. And CPR does kind of reach a point where once all of the initial stuff is done in that first couple of minutes, it gets a little bit quiet where, you know, really all you have is a person doing compressions and a person breathing and then everyone else is just kind of waiting. And so you start to feel like I should be doing something. Let me give more drugs, but try to, you know, prevent yourself from doing that and really only do it when enough time has passed that a second round of drugs is indicated. And so the reason that there's all of this focus on, you know, minimizing drug administration, minimizing frequency, using low doses of epinephrine is because all of these drugs will speed up heart rate. And so what we don't want to have happen is have a patient who is arrested and has a heart rate of zero, and then we resuscitate them and now they have a heart rate of 250 because they've got all these drugs on board, because that is a huge tax on their heart, that when their heart is beating that rapidly, it dramatically increases the, the myocardial demand for oxygen, and it actually does increase their risk for re-arresting because the heart just can't keep up. So we don't want to resuscitate them to a point of excessive tachycardia. Yes, I think we had a question there about what is the reasoning for starting with low dose epinephrine. So, so that's exactly it, is just to try to, you still get the beneficial effects of the vasoconstriction, but the purpose of it is that we're trying to prevent that excessive tachycardia that can be associated with, um, with really high doses. Okay, and then, oh, and intracardiac. Um, the question was, do you ever recommend 
um, giving epinephrine intracardiac. Don't steal my thunder. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. <laughs> okay, so um, drug administration. So if we're able to get venous access in these patients, that's ideal. And really what you want to aim for is a front leg because getting a catheter in a back leg in CPR probably is not super effective because the, those drugs have so far to travel to get to the heart and even get into central circulation that you really want to try and get a catheter in a front limb or in a jugular vein if you can. So when we give our drugs, we're going to administer it into an IV catheter, and then we're going to follow it with kind of a hard push of three to five mils of saline because we really want to get that up into the, some of the larger vessels so that it can be carried throughout circulation and really be absorbed. The other really important part of drug administration is verbalizing administration. So training your technicians or whoever's giving the drugs that when they draw it up and they are pushing it, they're going to say 0.1 mils of epi in one mil of atropine in. And that's important because it helps everyone hear and like, okay, I heard the doctor request those drugs. And so I heard that those were given. So nobody doubles up and does it twice. And then it's also for the person who is recording, then they can, you know, hear that that was done, write down what time the drugs were administered, and then everyone's on the same page. If you can't get an IV catheter in, then intratracheal drug administration is the next best thing. And so um, there's an acronym, NAVAL, which kind of tells you which drugs are safe to give through an endotracheal tube. And so that stands for naloxone, atropine, um, vasopressin, epinephrine, and lidocaine. So pretty much everything that you would need to safely run a code, you can give through the endotracheal tube. Um, there are some things like bicarb and other things that you don't want to give through an ET tube because they're kind of caustic to the, to the airways, but those drugs are all very safe to give. And so what we're going to do is if we have to do intratracheal drug administration, you're going to double your dose. So you'd refer to that chart, figure out what your IV dose would be, and then double that. And then this is where our red rubber catheter comes into play. So in the beginning, I had mentioned that that's a good thing to have with your crash cart, because what you'll do is actually take that red rubber catheter, you're gonna disconnect your endotracheal tube from your breathing system, feed that catheter all the way down, kind of as far as it can go, and administer your drugs through that. You'll push your drugs down the catheter, flush it with a little bit of saline, and then pull it out and reconnect your breathing circuit. And the purpose of that is just because, you know, because some of these drugs like epinephrine, if we're using low doses, it's going to be a very small volume. And so if you give 0.1 mils right into the hub of your endotracheal tube, that's probably where it's going to sit. You know, it'll never get far enough down to actually get absorbed across the surfaces of the airways. Um, so that's where that red rubber tube really, really comes in handy. So intracardiac drug administration is not recommended um, because um, if we think about what would have to happen for us to give intracardiac drugs, we'd have to stop compressions, right? And so that's the thing that we don't want to do. And we know that intratracheal drug administration is actually quite effective. So if we have that route to go, that's what we would choose if we don't have IV access. We don't want to do intracardiac because that does mean that you're stopping compressions to do it. Okay. So any questions there at all? Let's see if anything popped up here. Okay, I don't see anything that's popped up in the meantime. So now we'll move on. So we've kind of worked our way down the right arm of that um, algorithm there with giving it epinephrine, doing atropine if we do that, and then we continue with basic life support. So once those drugs are given, I mean, you're gonna continue and do another two minute cycle, and then you loop back around and repeat it and do the exact same thing. The difference would be that the next time you do a two minute cycle, there would be no drugs administered because we're doing it every other two minute cycle. So now we'll kind of look at, at the left arm of this algorithm. And so that is, what do you do if you look at your ECG and you do think that your patient is fibrillating or has what's called pulseless VTAC? So their ECG looks like VTAC, but you don't feel a pulse being conducted. So this is where you would use a defibrillator if you have one. And I totally recognize this, that most clinics do not. And that's totally fine because you don't use it very often. I mean, we have one and we use it extremely rarely. Um, but if you have a defibrillator, that's where you would charge your defibrillator and administer one shock. Um, it's different than TB. Again, we don't just keep shocking and shocking. We do one shock and then we go back to our compressions. Whether or not the rhythm converts, it doesn't matter. Um, and the doses for defibrillation are on that drug CPR chart. Um, and I'll, I'll mention if you 
So the, the purpose of defibrillation is that um, it is meant to kind of temporarily stun the heart. So we are actually trying to kind of stop the heart completely, stop that fibrillation and get them into asystole, ideally, because asystole is actually a rhythm that responds better to compressions than fibrillation does. And so that's what you're trying to do is kind of stop what the heart is doing and then try to get the heart restarted with your compressions. Um, if you don't have a defibrillator and if you think your patient is fibrillating, this is where it gets exciting. So the precordial thump, which is just as terrible as it sounds, but um, a precordial thump, basically what it is, is you kind of take your fist as hard as you can right over the heart. And you can actually generate, if you're strong, about like 10 or 15 joules of power by doing that, which is you know right up there with a defibrillator. So it's the same thing. I mean, you're trying to kind of stun their heart and get it to stop and then resume your compressions from there. And so um, you just do the one shock, then you go back into your two minute cycle, and then you go back around that loop again, come back to the top, reassess your patient, see what your ECG looks like and go from there. Okay, so Heidi's going to help me. I'm going to try and see if we can get a video to work here. I'm going to skip ahead like to 50 second mark or so. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, that's, that's good. Okay, so um, what this is, is this us is this is us doing a training session that we did for um, CPR with some of our team members earlier this year. And this is actually from Recover, where they send you this, um, this very fancy dog that actually has a simulator with it that generates ECG and end tidal CO2. You definitely don't need anything this fancy to do in, in CPR training. But I think this is just a really good thing to look at to kind of see how should a CPR go. So this would be kind of what's happening during our first two minute cycle where we've got someone doing compressions. Karen is the one that's doing the breathing. She just intubated the patient and um, connected our breathing circuit there. And then we've got Dr. Hansen standing there who's doing the recording, keeping track of time for us. Um, and then this is kind of where we start. And so when you look at um, the compressions that are happening, so we're up over the top of the patient, it's a nice deep compression. You actually, if you look, you can kind of see that she's sort of picking up her hands a little bit in between compressions. So trying to allow a full recoil of the chest. And then if you pay attention to Karen, who's doing the breathing, she's doing great, nice and slow. That's what it should be, very infrequent breaths. Um, and so we can see what our monitors are doing in the background. Um, we've got an ECG connected. And so, you know, the patient is arrested. There's no heartbeat, but we're still generating a waveform by the compressions that we're administering. And then the end tidal CO2, it was just reading at 13. But here's something important happens with our little simulator. It stops reading. So Karen, very smartly here, is about to just check and make sure our tube is still in the right place. That's the first thing, to make sure that your tube has not slipped out to the esophagus. And then what the simulator is trying to teach us here is that our compressor is getting tired because we're getting to the end of our two minute cycle. And so here we do a switch out. So Dr. Hansen had kind of warned us, we're almost to two minutes. So we all pause, we look at the ECG, we see that it's asystole. And so here we go again with round two of compressions. So that's what your changeover looks like. Brief, quick, just gives you enough time to look at your ECG. You can take a quick listen with your stethoscope or feel for a pulse during that time if you want to do that and then we just pick up right where we left off. And so then we'll, we should see if my compressions are good enough that our ET CO2 will start reading again momentarily. And then this is kind of where there's not a lot going on, you know, because in that first round we had given some drugs and so we're not going to be administering anything during this round. Um, so this is actually a good point where there we are. We have an entitled CO2 of 13. So it doesn't quite meet our goal. Ideally, we want to be at 15, but we know that we're at least generating a number. So our tube is in the right place and we're creating some degree of blood flow, which is what we're going for. And so when we get to kind of this second two minute cycle, this is often a good period of time where the doctor can go call the owner, you know, because really your staff should be able to run things for you from here. They do not need you present anymore if they know that they're just going to continue every two minutes swapping out compressors. Um, you could give directions like if there's still, you know, no heartbeat on your next cycle, give another dose of epinephrine, same dose. And so then that gives you some time to go contact those owners by whatever route is appropriate and let them know what is going on while your staff still feels comfortable and empowered to continue doing CPR without you present. So that's really important because what's happening right now, no reason for a doctor to be standing there. You can have any member of your team performing this. And if they're following those algorithm, algorithms, 
what they need to do there is, is very clear. And when in doubt, they would just continue compressions until you come back. Okay. Okay. So any questions there about that part of things? So that just gets us through CPR itself. Um, and so now the next part would be um, post-arrest care. So if we do resuscitate these patients and we actually get that return of spontaneous circulation, um, now we need to focus on the post-op care, so, or the post-arrest care, um, so that we try to prevent it from happening again, right? So one really important thing to recognize is that neurologic recovery takes time. I feel like this is a question we get a lot because I do, you know, we get calls from referring veterinarians and a lot of times it's about post-arrest cases that are anesthetic related and people start to get really worried when neurologically those patients aren't coming around within a short period of time. But what I would say is they will. I mean, the vast majority of patients, I can't think of very many that survived an arrest and didn't make a full neurologic recovery. It just takes time. You know, we know that they've had a period of hypoxia, their brain has been deprived of oxygen, so their brain's a little bit unhappy. Cats especially are very sensitive to that. And so it can take six or 12 hours sometimes before we even really start to see them respond. A lot of times they make huge improvements within that first 24 hours, but they just need time. So don't write them off just because they don't seem like they're coming around really quickly. The other thing is the fixed and dilated pupils thing um, is really not a prognostic indicator um, because you know it, it can take a while for the brain to really start registering light and things like that again. And the other piece of it is if you did give atropine during your CPR, um, that is a side effect of atropine is dilated of the dilation of the pupils. And so that's gonna last for several hours. So if you don't get a pupillary light response right away, don't be concerned that that means that there's permanent brain damage there. Um, so things that we want to focus on are maintaining normal blood pressure, um, trying to treat their underlying condition, you know, to really think about, okay, how did we get here? What can I do to reverse this so that this doesn't happen again? Um, ECG monitoring, if you can do some continuous monitoring, that's helpful just because a lot of these patients will have some arrhythmias just because we probably do um, cause some bruising to the heart by doing compressions. Most of the time, if that happens, it's very mild and not anything that really needs to be treated, but it's a good thing to keep an eye on. Monitoring kidney function for those first 24 hours is important too, because the kidneys are very finicky little organs that, you know, if they are deprived of adequate blood supply for a period of time, sometimes you will see some evidence of acute kidney injury there. And then kind of tolerating some mild hypothermia is, is okay too. And so we don't, we shouldn't feel like we have to really aggressively warm these patients. You know, if they've got a temp of 98, 99 after CPR, that's pretty common. And actually that can be beneficial because it slows down their metabolic rate a little bit, slows down their oxygen consumption, those kinds of things. So um, just supporting their temperature but you don't have to try to rapidly get them back up to a normal temp. Okay, so um, we're kind of at the end here. So overall return of spontaneous circulation, that ROSC, um, actually is, I mean, not terrible. You know, 35% in dogs and 44% of cats. So that means if they arrest and we do CPR, that's how frequently we get heart rate back. But it's only those 6% that survive to discharge. And so that's the number that we're really trying to improve. Um, it's tricky in veterinary medicine because obviously euthanasia plays a huge role in, you know, the big discrepancy between those numbers that, you know, maybe you resuscitate this patient and then call the owner to talk about what's involved going forward and they elect not to proceed. So obviously that definitely does play a role. The thing I want to call your attention to is anesthetic arrest. So that is a very different situation where survival to discharge, not ROSC, but survival to discharge is 50%. So a lot of those patients, you really can successfully get them back. And so that's why being really comfortable with resuscitating a patient that has an anesthetic arrest is important because one out of every two patients will go home when that happens. And that's where having those reversal drugs on hand and things like that is really going to improve your, your outcomes to try to get them stable as quickly as you can. Um, out of hospital arrest, meaning, you know, those patients that get rushed in that are already in full arrest, 
it's pretty grave. I mean, very few of those do we even get a heartbeat back and it's pretty rare that they survive to discharge. I don't think that will change too much, you know, based on what we do, those are just really hard cases because a lot of those patients have already been arrested probably for several minutes. But it'll be interesting to see, you know, once they go back and Recover's been out for a while and they go back and reevaluate these numbers to see, you know, has anything changed and does it seem like this is improving if we're following the recommendations. So the keys to success are following recover guidelines and just familiarizing yourself with those and trying to, to train your staff. So the compressions, 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 start those right away. Make sure you're doing an appropriate compression based on your patient's size and confirmation, allowing that full chest recoil, doing those two minute cycles with no interruptions, avoiding overventilation. So just, you know, that 10 breaths per minute, and then really emphasizing getting your team involved and getting them as comfortable with CPR. Uh, as comfortable with CPR as you can. Having a reversible cause of arrest certainly doesn't hurt either. You know, I mean, if it is anesthetic re related and we can reverse drugs or if it's from hypoglycemia and we can address that, I mean, obviously that definitely makes it much easier to prevent um, a second episode of arrest. Okay, so we're at the end here. Let me look and just see if we had, okay. Okay, so um, the question is, one of the questions is, when is oxygen indicated and how much? So um, the answer to that sort of depends on where you're at in the resuscitation process. So if you can hook your patient up to oxygen right away, as soon as you intubate them when you start CPR, that's definitely helpful. With that said, um, if you don't have quick access to oxygen, doing the AMBU bag is still helpful because that's still going to give them some oxygen, still going to help expand their lungs. So it's ideal to have that connected to oxygen when you're doing your initial resuscitation, but it's not a deal breaker. And then for the patients that are recovering from, you know, let's say we successfully resuscitate them and we're doing some post-arrest care, um, we usually will keep them on oxygen for just a couple of hours until we feel like they're ventilating normally and breathing comfortably and then take them off of oxygen as soon as we can. Some patients will end up with complications like bruising to their lungs from compressions. And so they might actually be a little bit oxygen dependent, but if they're oxygenating normally and breathing comfortably, you should actually try to get them off oxygen as soon as you can, because there's you know, all this evidence about free radical formation and all these other things that can cause complications with excessive use of oxygen. So we wean as, as quickly as tolerated. Um, so the next question was, what kind of fluid and volumes are you recommending? So that's a really great, great question too. So fluids are one of the, you notice that it's nowhere in that algorithm. And so the only time that I would really say fluids are indicated is if I know or have a very high degree of suspicion that that patient arrested because of fluid loss, like if it's an acute hemoabdomen or something like that. And I think that hypovolemia is directly related to why they arrested in the first place. That's the only time I would give fluids. And um, as far as fluid administration, you can pretty safely do, um, you know, you want to do boluses, so kind of rapid fluid administration. So usually what we'll do is start with, you know, 10 mils per pound or so. So, a, you know, a 50 pound dog would get a 500 mil bolus of fluids over 10 minutes or so. You know, you kind of squeeze it in and give it as quickly as you can. But it's important to recognize that fluid administration is not part of the standard CPR recommendations. And that's really because, you know, it's just one more thing that maybe takes your attention away from where it should be focused, which is on compressions and just good basic life support. So, that's what I would say is, you know, if you think that they arrested because they're bleeding and, and that is the reason, then that's when I would give, give fluids. Otherwise, I usually don't initially. That was for me. I already answered it. Okay. Any other questions at all? Okay. Well, thank you um, everyone for attending and I hope that was helpful for you. And, you know, like I said, I, I do think it is worth, um, you know, especially if you want to learn more or if you want to look into ways of training your, your team members to go to that Recover website and look at some of the resources they're there because it's super helpful. There's other questions that, you know, you think of, you can reach out to me or Heidi and I can certainly let you know. And then we will send out the, um, the PowerPoint slides afterwards too.